Welcome to Celebration 2021, Leadership Jacksonville's annual celebration of leadership. My name is Kendall Ford. I will be one of your hosts for tonight's program. I'm a proud alum of Youth Leadership Jacksonville 2021 and am a sophomore at Stanton College Preparatory School. Hello, my name is Charlotte Cackham. I'm a sophomore at Samuel Wolfson High School and I'm also a recent graduate of Youth Leadership Jacksonville 2021. I am honored to be a co-host for Celebration 2021. Tonight, we are bringing our program to you from several locations. Charlotte and I are joining you from MOSH, the Museum of Science and History. Tonight's program recognizes unsung COVID leaders in Northeast Florida, individuals who have made a positive impact during the pandemic. While our event is virtual, you can interact with other viewers on YouTube throughout the program. You can participate in conversations in the live chat section or leave a comment. Proceeds from Celebration 2021 support Youth Leadership Jacksonville, so please consider making a contribution. Enjoy the evening. We will begin tonight with an inspirational reading. Good evening, my name is Natalie Rabel and I'm also a graduate of Youth Leadership Jacksonville 2021. I'm completing my sophomore year at the Episcopal School of Jacksonville. The following message is from the Drum Major Instinct by Martin Luther King Jr. and speaks to servant leadership. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's your new definition of greatness. The thing that I like about it, by giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. Tonight, we are celebrating the stories of six outstanding leaders. You may recognize their names, but some are likely new to you. This year, Leadership Jacksonville asked the community to nominate unsung COVID leaders, people who made a difference during the pandemic. From 38 diverse nominations, six stories were selected, and tonight you will be hearing directly from those honorees. Our first honoree this evening is Jim Colbert from Duval County Public Schools. Let's learn more about the impact he made on behalf of students, teachers, and administrators. Congrats, Mr. Colbert. Um, my name is Jim Colbert. I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer for Duval County Public Schools. Um, I proudly served this district for the last 22 years. During when the pandemic hit, and over that spring break period, we were basically received an extra week to pull 150,000 students online with fidelity uh, as quickly as possible. So during that time, what we did was we took our existing platform that we had been using for years and we ramped that up and scaled it up so we could handle all those students logging in. Because one of the most important things to happen was that on day one that every student logged in. You couldn't leave five kids out. Everybody had to be there because a lot of them had been home anyways without their friends, without their students, and everybody wanted to be able to log in and participate. So one of the most important things that we did was we went and handed out laptops because many of our students, especially in some of our impoverished areas, just do not have access to technology. So we spent that time opening up 15 different sites across um, the county where you could just pick up a laptop, you could pick up anything that you needed to get yourself online and ready to go. And what we found was the most amazing thing through those 10 days, and we gave out 35,000 machines, is every time that we gave a student a laptop and a hotspot, we saw them participate the next day. And that was the most heartwarming thing that you could see, that a student that wasn't able to be online was suddenly online and participating with their teachers and the students. 
So as you can imagine, when you're having, when you're trying to support 150,000 students online, we went from having a help desk of 15 people to 75 people. And the people that stepped in were amazing. We had paraprofessionals. We had the extended day workers. We had people from maintenance, substitute teachers that were all working from home and then taking those calls for the students when then they were having issues. And then when it ultimately came down to something that just couldn't be fixed over the phone, we had 10 sites in town where you could just drive up with whether you're a teacher or a student and just swap out your equipment for something new. Uh, we had to work with Microsoft. We met with them twice a day, every day. And our fantastic teachers were doing such an amazing job supporting themselves through these online chat rooms that we had set up for them. So they were supporting themselves and then they would kick back the major issues to, to us. And then we would go to Microsoft and we would work through those twice a day, every day, and they would go back to their engineering team and try to make those resolve. If you've seen, um, if you've been a Teams user over the last year, you've seen Teams start as a platform and then it grow very rapidly. And a lot of those innovations and changes that have come to Teams has come directly from the teachers right here in Jacksonville. I more than anybody want to have all of our students back in school because as you can imagine how challenging it is even at this point when you have you know 20 to 30,000 students at home, um, teachers at home, and then still supporting all of the students that are in school. So one of the big changes that we did this year is we bought 60,000 laptops and we have moved all of our secondary students to complete one-to-one. -one. So now every secondary student, whether you're in middle or high school, has a laptop assigned to you and you use that machine during the day and then you take it home with you at night. So for those students, if a pandemic or like recently what happened with the possible hurricane coming to Jacksonville, you can quickly shift back to Duval Homeroom and, and everybody has the same equipment. I think some people have asked, you know, why, why spend all the money that we have um, to put secondary one-to-one -one devices out there. And really, we did it so every student would have the same. There is something that's called the digital divide, and it does really exist here in Jacksonville. And unfortunately, it affects our most impoverished students. So the one-to-one -one allowed that every student got to participate every day. They got to go home, and they had the ability to get onto their online classes, the online textbooks, um, and get on, on to all the different blended learning solutions that we have. And then most importantly, if those students didn't have technology, they would not have been able to see their teacher, they would not have been able to see their friends during the whole pandemic online, live and be able to talk to them. They would have been stuck with doing stuff basically in workbooks and pens and pen, pencil and paper. Um, we've done a lot of great things and um, you know, Jacksonville just really, I mean, they, the entire town killed it. I mean, we were the first large school district in Florida, go online. Everybody was watching us, and we did it in an amazing way. I will never forget that first day uh, when we launched Duval Homeroom. We had 80,000 students successfully log in in 30 minutes. That was just absolutely amazing. Um, and to see those, those teachers, they completed 35 million video calls with their students within the first six months of Duval Homeroom. Just absolutely incredible what they were able to accomplish. And I, and I cannot take all credit for this. It's a, I have an amazing people that, that, that work for me and we've worked together as a team. Um, all of Duval has really come together, pivot and moved with us through this whole pandemic. And obviously the teachers and the students, they did as much hard work um, as anybody in my division through this whole pandemic. Our next honoree is John Inseta, owner of Black Sheep Restaurant Group. Enjoy his story demonstrating the power of community and collaboration. Congratulations, Mr. Inseta. My name is Jonathan Inseta. I'm the chef owner of Black Sheep Restaurant Group, which is Orsay, Black Sheep, and Bellwether. The pandemic has changed the way we do business drastically. Um, you know, we're definitely more centered on the to-go orders, on the online ordering, and finding ancillary sources of revenue during this time, um, which has made us, I guess, smarter when it comes to certain things like that, and has given us additional revenue stream after the pandemic. But at the beginning of it, it changes drastically. We had to shut down. We had to close our shop. We had to let go 150 people, kept our managers on, um, but in that time, we were able to start a program 
for groceries weekly for our employees. Um, we have a charity account with Cisco where we have a certain amount of money allotted every year to do charity events. So we took that money and pushed it towards the grocery program for our staff. Um, we had to, all the managers had to go down to a minimum salary to make sure we could just get through. And I guess the biggest fear in the beginning was the uncertainty of what's going to happen. You know, there was so much or so lack of knowledge on what the future and the near future entailed that it was so intense and so tangible what we were facing um, that we kind of thought, what can we do that's positive for our community, that's positive for our coworkers, and how can we not turn something bad into something good, but how can we bring some light during such a dark time? Luckily, I had a thought to call Suzanne King at Feeding Northeast Florida, um, and that conversation went amazing um, to the point of me crying on the phone with her. Um, we knew we had a skill set to cook food. We wanted to get the food we had and possibly the food they had into the hands of the community in some form or fashion of prepared meals, but Susan King is really the hero here. She put the entire program together in about five minutes on the phone. So what Susan came up with was, was the SHARE program, and she came up with it within five minutes of us letting her know what we could do, and then she just took the dots, connected them, and did an amazing job. And I'm not sure the final numbers, but I think by December, the group of restaurants that were involved in that served over half a million meals to to the elderly in the community. And it also supplied about 13 jobs, um, part-time and full-time jobs to our staff that needed work at that time. Which the idea, I think it's very rare that you have a symbiotic program, usually has one end user for the, for the charity program. You know, there's usually one in this situation. It was helping out, you know, my, my coworkers who needed huge help, as well as helping the community. I think it's extremely rare to have that in a program. And all the other restaurants that were involved, it's the same, the same process, you know, help them kind of get through some really hard times, helped get a little bit of money into the hands of people who needed it, but also got meals into people's safe meals um, during COVID into people's hands that really, really needed it. So it's a pretty special win-win situation, which you, again, you don't, you know, you usually see one layer in a charity, you see two layers here, helping out the hospitality industry and also helping out the elderly in need. It's funny, both Susan and I had conversations separately with CBC about that, and she was able to bring it together and get the, get the food donated from TBC that was going to go to the guests of the event, um, which is a huge help. And, you know, it was a lot of food that would have just been wasted. You know, TBC supported this throughout the entire thing. They were amazing in this process. Um, I believe Florida Blue as well, but Florida Blue was really the big one, and they took on with their commissary kitchen they took on a huge load of the, of the process and they really allowed us to up that volume. You know, as small independent restaurants, we have a small crew. You know, so we can only produce so much, we have a small kitchen, we're not set up for that. So we were able to really transform how we did our day to day into that production, which of course in the beginning there's, you know, some challenges, some issues and learning how to do it properly. But Sabrina, Reese, the entire crew, Carrie Rogers, our executive chef at Bellwether at the time, uh, just took it on and took it on an amazing level. Um, within two or three weeks, we became very efficient. We got the production down. We were able to spot jobs and put out, I think it was 1,000 meals a week we were doing roughly, if not a little more out of there. Um, I think it'd be anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000, somewhere in there. I personally would like to thank all the restaurants and companies involved in this from the, from the support from a charitable. I'd like to thank the Chartrand Foundation. I'd like to thank, especially Feeding Northeast Florida and Susan King for having the the mind and the intent and ability to put this program together. I mean, it's one of the most proudest things I've ever been part of. And I want to thank the restaurant community in general, all my peers in the industry who stepped up to the plate and made this whole thing possible. Lexi Magnano is a high school student who is making a difference for homeless families in St. John's County. I am happy to share that she is a Wild J 2021 graduate too. Congratulations, Lexi. My name is Alexis Magnano and I'm a sophomore at Ponte Vedra High School. I founded the Smart Art Club at Ponte Vedra High School in 2020. And the goal of this club was to bring STEAM and art projects to underserved areas in my community. 
Ever since I was young, I've been a Girl Scout, and so I've been bringing, I've been doing projects with different areas in my community, and I've been volunteering since I was young, and I've always loved art and science, so bringing areas of that might not have these resources was really important to me so that girls and just children everywhere were able to have the opportunity to find something they may love. For the past few years, my older brother and I had been doing art history presentations and following that with a hands-on art project at um, memory care homes and retirement and nursing homes in St. Johns County. We were doing that up until COVID and when COVID-19 hit, we weren't able to visit anymore. Because of the CDC guidelines and us not being able to visit the memory care homes and nursing homes, I started to look for different areas where um, we could visit and hold these activities in person. So I was asking around and that's when I came across Miss Bridges at the um, Homeless Coalition of St. John's County. And the Homeless Coalition of St. John's County is a group of 20 houses and it's a transitional housing center. So it's a step up from being homeless. She was allowing us to visit and bring donations and do STEAM and art projects with the residents of the coalition. We started in about September and we'll come on a day off from school and we'll bring people from anywhere who, wanted, who wants to volunteer. We'll bring resources like wipes or diapers for the babies or bed sheets or clothing, just anything they may need. And then um, a project along with resources to do the project and we will meet the kids and we just have a great time and hanging out while teaching them something. So the birthday bucket program is a program where about once a month um, there's about 50 children at the Homeless Coalition and they'll get an individualized bucket full of things that they may be interested in or just little presents and it will be delivered to them on their birthday so that especially during times like the COVID-19 pandemic where self-isolation is a little bit more prominent than it used to be, it can help these children feel loved and supported. One of my favorite interactions with some of the children at this group is one of my favorite children, Jakaya. She is in sixth grade and we've been working with her since the first time we visited. And she started off a little bit shy, but now every time we go, we always look for her as soon as we get there and she'll give us her latest life update. It's just been a lot of fun to see her grow and trust us more uh, the more times we visited. And I think one of my favorite experiences was when I was asking the children what their dream was because I can Photoshop on my phone pretty quickly. So I would ask them what their dream was and I could Photoshop them into that situation to make their dream a reality. And Jakaya told me, the first time she told me that she wanted to be an astronaut, so I put her in outer space. But then the second time, she came up to me later that day and told me that she wanted to be a football player for Florida, for Florida State University. So I was able to Photoshop her into a football player at Florida State University. And I think that was really cool because you don't really see girls in football that much. And I think that's great that that's her dream. And that's what she wants to be when she's older. So I think being able to help her show that that could be a reality was definitely one of my favorite experiences. Last Friday, we did a cleanup around the coalition, and I would like to give a special thanks to three of my friends, Molly, Bella, and Abby, for always coming and always helping me accomplish these tasks at the coalition, and they're always so excited to come, and it's so great to see other kids my age who are really excited to be helping people.
Chandra Manning has done great work for the Jacksonville Speech and Hearing Center. Enjoy hearing her story. It is one that will surely make you smile. I'm Chandra Manning. I'm the Director of Operations with Jacksonville Speech and Hearing Center. No one was prepared for what was going to come in March of 2020. And we found ourselves with an office that shut down and could no longer provide the communication healthcare services that the community needed. We have this incredible team and started putting them out on, on a board and figuring out who could do what to continue to help our patients and the community from where we were and where they were. And as I'm doing that, I realized we have all of these hearing devices, hearing aids in our center that need to get to the people that need them to hear these messages that they have to receive over the next several months. And I started putting them in bags by the area of town they live in. And then the leadership got together and we decided to deliver those to the individuals that needed them. They were incredibly grateful and we are devising a plan for other people to drop their hearing aids off at the center because they're not working and they need to be able to hear. And a single staff member at a time coming into the office to make sure there's someone there to receive hearing aids from a drop box and then send those by mail to the audiologist who then figure out what needs to be done with them and ship them back to the patients. Right before that, we started working on the children that need their speech therapy services, which seems like it might be an easier thing to do, but it's, it's just as difficult to work through because the children need to be able to see their therapist to work through some of the things that they're working through, but a lot of what they do is hands-on. So one of our therapists found this amazing program that allowed interaction between the therapist and the child from their home. So we start that transition also. And now we can help all of those children that we were already helping in the center, at the schools, and in their homes. Uh, and then as we do that, we realize that there just are some patients that can't receive their services that way. They really do need to come into the office to receive their services. And as we started to open back up, we have to think about those safety precautions for our patients and for our staff. I, I separated the days that the children came into the office from the days that our senior population came into the office and the days that certain staff members came into the office versus um, others that could stay home and do uh, telehealth and teletherapy. And then um, as they're coming into the office, we realize that our mouths are covered and the people that need to see our mouths for communication purposes now can't. Um, and so started sewing, <laughs> came up with probably five different designs for masks that involved a, a portion that allowed people to see their mouths we went through probably five different types of masks before we found one that was going to be safe for our, our staff and still allow them to do the work that they needed to do with their patients. Our patients love the masks. They want them for themselves and we find that we're receiving a lot of inquiries about these masks that we've made and distributed to all of our staff. So we teamed up with Rethreaded and they did all the masks <laughs> and they, they were able to sell them. And so the community now has these clear masks that they can get for their friends and family members. And then at the end of all of it, we were able to get all of the children, the speech services that they need, all of the senior population, the hearing services they need, and keep every single staff member full-time employed. I'm grateful to our speech team um, every single speech language pathologist that was able to quickly convert their children to teletherapy and find ways to have that continuity of care. And I'm also incredibly grateful for our audiologist because that is a hands-on healthcare 
type of service. So they had to work extra hard to figure out how to do what they would need to show someone in person through a computer or over the phone and take all of their stuff home for programming and updating things and then ship them out to patients. So that all of our clinical staff had to learn a new way to provide their clinical services in a very short period of time. So incredibly grateful for the entire team that we have at Jacksonville Speech and Hearing Center that just jumped on board with whatever idea I threw out there so that we could continue helping the community. Our medical community has been called upon in challenging ways during the pandemic. Dr. Alberto Romero stepped forward to help heal spirits as well as bodies. Congratulations, Dr. Romero. So my name is Alberto Romero. I'm an emergency resident at UF Health. My role in the hospital uh, basically, we are the first people you see when you go through the hospital. Um, no matter what it is that you have, you have shortness of breath, if you're having a heart attack, if you're having a stroke, we're the first line of defense uh, in the emergency department. My journey to being a physician is uh, rather circuitous. Um, I was actually an international affairs major, creative writing minor. Um, and then one day my mom was shot in the head. Um, she's alive, um, doing well, but that whole event uh, changed my perspective on life and made me appreciate uh, life that much more. Uh, she was the major breadwinner. I quit school at the time, became a roofer, made enough money to go to community college. Uh, long story short, here I am as a physician and um, that event made me realize how important it was to not just be a great clinician, um, but to show warmth, kindness um, to the patients that I care for. It was particularly important for my family that I was one of the first to even graduate college, much less be a physician. It's a big deal. Typically, uh, prior to COVID, um, we worked an average about you know 60 hours a week in the emergency department but after COVID it I mean we took more call we were called in much more often uh, many of our colleagues would get sick and you know we'd have to step up and um, try to cover those shifts as best we could um, but you know that's what we signed up for right you know uh, we signed up to be there for people in the worst of times, and this was definitely one of the, one of them. I realized that during COVID, the peak of COVID, we had so many sick patients without the comfort of their families. They would suffer alone, and you know, as much as we could while we were working, it was difficult for us to be at bedside while we were working clinically. So on my days off, uh, during my break time, I would go and start playing music for patients. Um, it was this one patient in particular that kind of kicked this off. Um, we had a patient, he was in his 30s. Um, his dad was sick in a different part of the hospital. Mother was in a uh, nursing home, so she could, definitely couldn't come in and he was dying and so I'm on the phone with the mother and she says the worst feeling in the world is knowing that my son's gonna die alone and so I promised her that that wasn't gonna happen that I would be by his side uh, in his last moments and what I did is I sat by his bedside I had my guitar and I w would play music um, while he was being weaned off life support as she wished. 
Um, and it made the biggest difference in the world to her. And so I try, when I get the moment, to do that for uh, my other patients. Um, just be there, play music for them, just talk with them, uh, help them, you know, realize that, you know, they're not just a patient, they're a human being. Know that one? Did you know it? No. <laughs> but we liked it. It was good. So me playing for my patients isn't completely self selfless, right? Uh, I I do get something out of it, and I think it's what a lot of us physicians want from practicing medicine, and that's forming these relationships with people um, and forging these bonds that you know can span a lifetime. In the emergency department, we don't have that luxury most of the time. I wanted something more. I wanted uh, to be there for patients and I, I get a sense of, of purpose um, when I do so. I mean, I am grateful for our resilient medical staff. Um, I mean, we have nurses that are working overtime, uh, working extra days, and you know, they do their best taking care of really sick people um, day in and day out. Um, I'm grateful for my, my colleagues as well. Um, they're very hard workers and they do their best. Um, honestly, I'm grateful for people like Dr. Caro, um, He's the emergency medicine, uh, uh, the chair and um, program director, and you know he's encouraging and allows me to do things like this. Dr. Maddox as well; she's an incredible mentor, um, and they sort of perpetuate this sense of uh, warmth and kindness that I wish to also perpetuate with my patients. Despite the isolation of the pandemic, youth continue to need the support of positive adult role models. Lafric Thomas Jr. worked with other volunteers to fill the need. Congratulations, Mr. Thomas. I'm Lafric Thomas Jr. and I am the founder of the Straight and Narrow Project. The Straight and Narrow Project is a youth development program for students ages 10 to 18. We started out 13 to 18, however, we had a school named Sally B. Mathis Elementary that really wanted us to work with their elementary school students, so we dropped the age down to 10 to get some of their students to get involved with us. Um, so this program works with school students that want to do uh, educational enhancement, life coaching, life skills, and also community service. So we provide a lot of community service with our students and we average about 500 hours of community service per year with our students. So we have an umbrella with um, mentoring initiatives, tutoring initiatives, and we also go into doing a whole bunch of family involvement um, mentoring as well. So the area that we typically focus on is the 322-08-09-1819 area. Um, when we first got our start, we did our youth summit back in May 20th on 2017. And Ms. Marshall Berry, who was the um, head librarian at the Edgewood Library, the Brandon Brooks Library, was the person who gave us our start and believed in us. And we had over 150 kids, over 50 parents attend sessions that day in the library on a public Saturday. Um, so after that, we were able to tap in with our Rains High Schools, our Rebought High Schools, 
um, the middle schools in the surrounding areas, your Highlands, Northwesterns, and we were able to grab those kids and have them in our program, and it's only expanded so far. So now we have students as far as Nassau County to Clay County, and all of them come and we meet still at that Edgewood Bradham Brooks Library every Saturday when it was open. And now we meet in an outside location due to the pandemic to make sure everybody is social distance and safe. The pandemic impacted us in a positive way, actually. Um, so we started going virtual until we felt comfortable bringing our students back um, for face-to-face -face contact. So we did virtual sessions. We brought in interesting people for them to hear from, talk to. We did tutoring online because we knew that students were not going to have the best time being in school virtually to, um, every day and then on Saturdays dealing with us for another two hours. So we had to cut down our times, but then when we came back the following school year, this school year now presently, our numbers actually grew and we got more students in. We had more students who wanted to be involved because we kept being involved because their programs were being shut down because of no face-to-face -face contact. So through virtual learning and through virtual coaching and through virtual mentoring, our families got involved and we ended up bringing students back face-to-face outside, playing in the park, getting active community service, and then also doing some fun interactive things that intrigued their mind as well. One thing that we do have now that we probably did not have during the pandemic was that we have way more interaction. We were able to be creative in a way that we never expected due to no contact, no physical contact. So now we have students who are longing and wanting to be um, in our presence. So for an example, we have a program, mentoring initiative called the Success Academy that has, each student has their own personal mentor in which they call and contact and they come together on Saturdays in a corporate setting and we speak and we talk about things during the week and they have lessons that they learn. And because we have not had that physical contact, they come back now and they want to have that physical contact with their students, with their, with their mentors, because they're missing it and longing it for it now. So now we're seeing our students really become um, involved and want to become um, interactive with everyone because they have missed it for so long. And that's something we didn't really get to, to see beforehand, but now because we've been displaced for so long, it's there and we enjoy it. One of the community service projects we were able to do during COVID was each year our students really love going to the Clara White Mission and feeding the homeless. However, during the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. So this year we carefully got together and we packed bag lunches and we also packed care packages for the homeless. And so we set up downtown and we had on our gloves, had on our masks and we went out and we gave out over 250 care packages. Our students walked the streets, our mentors walked the streets with our students. Um, we enjoyed going out and we enjoyed uh, supplying those people who may have been the forgotten community with those things that they may have needed. This work could not be done um, without the mentors that I have in the organization. Um, I have to thank um, my, my mentors, Jason, Ashley, Malia, Desiree, and even those in the past um, who helped build this foundation who are no longer with us as well. Um, we are a grassroots organization, boots on the ground. We go out and we do, we get our hands dirty every single day, every week. We're at schools, we're at parent-teacher conferences, we're on blue cards. <laughs> we are everything these families are for us and we also want to give a big thanks to the parents and to the students who stick it out with us who uh, hear us nag them all all along about being better and, and our parents who allow us in their homes invite us to dinners let us come and enjoy and share their child with us we have to thank them because without them there's no us i thank everybody who supported us um, and helped us um, along the way our community is truly fortunate to have these outstanding leaders in our great city Thank you to all of our unsung COVID leaders for what you have done in Northeast Florida and for letting us honor you tonight. There are a lot of people to thank today, especially the gracious sponsors who have been listed on the screen and are in tonight's program. Without our sponsors, Celebration 2021 would not be possible. Celebration supports Youth Leadership Jacksonville and our sponsors and donors make it happen. Thank you. The list of those who made tonight possible also includes Lindsay Films and Client Focus Media, who filmed and edited Celebration 2021. Thank you. Now, it is my honor to introduce another outstanding community leader. Please welcome Bruce Fafard, the President of the Board of Leadership Jacksonville. I'm pleased to greet you this evening on behalf of the Leadership Jacksonville Board of Directors. Tonight, 
has been a night of celebration for Leadership Jacksonville. During this difficult year for our community and world, we are pleased to have presented the stories of six individuals who have made a difference in the lives of their neighbors in Northeast Florida. While their stories were unique, each person has improved the lives of others through the giving of their ingenuity, time, and heart. We also celebrate the work of over 30 others who made a difference. Their names are appearing on the screen now. While we could not share every story, we thank everyone nominated for the work they have done. Tonight's program raises funds for Youth Leadership Jacksonville, our program that educates, connects, and inspires high school students to commit to improving their community now and as they move through their lives. We thank the many sponsors who have made this evening possible. Please consider joining them by contributing to support Youth Leadership Jacksonville. You can make a donation by texting YLJ to 44321 or by visiting leadershipjacks.org. Thank you to all the youth who participated in tonight's program and to Leadership Jacksonville staff who made it all come together. And again, thank you to our honorees for sharing your stories.